Why do some airports have huge swings in temperature between the day and the night, and others, they're just hot and muggy all night long? We're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about how you can practically use that information to plan a flight. So in our last video, we asked the question, does it really make a difference if you depart in the morning with lower density altitude? And I think the answer that we found is yes, especially at airports that have large swings between the daytime high and the nighttime low temperature. And especially when you're flying an airplane that gets close to its service ceiling. But it does bring up the question, why do some airports have a huge swing in temperature in DA and others that swing is fairly moderate? The answer comes down to where the heat in our atmosphere comes from. And I know this sounds fairly academic, it's something you'd read out of an aviation textbook, but we can really use this to help us make decisions in our route planning when you're planning a long distance flight. Because especially in the United States, if you're flying on a long distance trip, chances are you're gonna cross quite a bit of different types of terrain. And it's that terrain that really affects how that air warms up during the day and cools down at night. Now to put this into some practical examples, we're gonna look at four different airports and they're gonna fall into kind of two different groups. So we're gonna look at Gatlinburg, Tennessee, St. Louis, Missouri, Grand Junction, Colorado, and then Sacramento, California. As I said, these airports kind of fall into two different groups. Both Gatlinburg and St. Louis have more moderate swings, swinging about 20 degrees Fahrenheit between the daytime mean max temperature for July and the daytime mean low. And that gives us a density altitude swing of about 1,250 feet. Then when you look at Grand Junction, Colorado and Sacramento, California, both of those airports have about a 30 degree swing in Fahrenheit between the daytime mean max in July and the daytime mean low. And that gives us a DA swing of about 2,000 feet, roughly at both of the airports. If you look at these four airports, they're spread across the United States and they're all at different MSL altitudes. Sacramento is at 24 feet MSL. Grand Junction, on the other hand, is at 4,861 feet. So it's not the airport elevation that's driving this temperature swing. Instead, it's the surface of the earth. And it's because that is what's responsible for heating the air up during the day and cooling it down at night. And it comes down to a principle called the Earth's energy budget. So the Earth's energy budget is gonna drive the average daily weather that you're gonna find at any location in the United States. When you don't have something like a cold front or a warm front or a larger scale weather pattern moving through. And that's because the energy budget controls the change in temperature. And the change in temperature is what drives our weather. Now we dig into this in depth in the mountain weather course because it is so important to understanding weather wherever you are. But we're gonna take a quick high level overview now. So essentially, we've got radiation coming in from the sun during the day, and then throughout the day and the night, some radiation going from the Earth back out into space. During the day, we've got just a lot of net incoming radiation, and that's gonna go one of three places. It goes deep into the Earth, it goes up into the air, warming it up. We call that sensible heat flux, but you can just think of that as a change in air temperature. And then it also evaporates out water on the surface of the Earth, which also consumes some of the energy. So the key thing here is all of those four things need to balance each other out. If you use more energy to evaporate out that water, then you're gonna have less energy to heat the air. At night, the exact opposite happens. So with no incoming radiation, then we just have net outgoing radiation. And so that energy needs to come from either deep within the earth, it needs to come from the air, which cools it down, or it's gonna come from humidity in the air, which condenses out as water and releases energy. Okay, let's go back to those four cities. So no surprise, Gatlinburg and St. Louis are much more humid than Grand Junction and Sacramento. And so that means that in Gatlinburg and St. Louis, during the day, more of that energy is going into evaporating out moisture. And so that leaves less energy to heat up the air. Now it's still hot but it would be even hotter if there was no moisture there. And then at night, some of that moisture in Gatlinburg in St. Louis is going to condense out of the atmosphere, releasing energy. So we need to take less energy out of the air at night 
so the air doesn't cool down as much, which makes sense, right? Because if you've ever slept in St. Louis at night, trying to cool down with the windows open, it doesn't work. On the other hand, Grand Junction and Sacramento, very dry. So we're pushing a lot of energy into the air during the day, and we're sucking a lot of energy out of the air at night. Okay, so that energy budget drives kind of that big, broad equation for air temperature. But the shape of terrain also has a massive influence. And if you look at Grand Junction and Sacramento, there's one thing that they've got in common that also emphasizes those swings. Okay, so it's the ground or the surface of the earth that actually warms the air during the day, not the sun's energy passing through the air. So it makes sense that if we could surround the air with more terrain that's being warmed by the sun, that means we could heat up the air even more. And that's exactly what happens over mountains and inside of a mountain valley. We call this the valley volume effect. So if you think about the plains, you've got a flat line, right? The plains, and then you've got a large volume of air above that and the planes are transferring energy up into the air during the day. But now when we look at a valley, there's much more terrain surface area that's being warmed by the sun or receiving the sun's energy. And so now there's more surface area to transfer energy into the air. At the same time, we have less volume of air inside the valley, which means that every air molecule ends up receiving a larger dose of energy during the day. And so that's why a valley will warm up more during the day and cool down more at night than plains would if everything else was the same. Same altitude, same humidity, same kind of soil, stuff like that. And this drives the weather patterns that you're gonna find over the mountains. We're gonna talk about this even more as we start to dig into thunderstorms. But the key thing to think about here is that a valley is gonna really emphasize those swings between daytime high temperatures and nighttime low temperatures. And if you look at both Grand Junction and Sacramento, those are both in valleys. Grand Junction's in the Grand River Valley, which is kind of bigger than I think people typically think of when you think of a valley, but it still behaves like a valley nonetheless. And of course, Sacramento is in California's Central Valley. Now, when you look at Gatlinburg and you look at St. Louis, the terrain is much flatter. Yes, St. Louis is in the Mississippi River Valley, but that's more of a broad floodplain. And so you don't get all of that extra terrain effect that you would get normally with a valley volume effect. Okay, so how can you practically use this? Well, number one, if you're departing from an area that's very dry and very hot during the day, do not underestimate the value of an early morning departure. The other part comes down to route planning. If you've ever planned a long cross country or you've got to cross some sort of terrain, you oftentimes find that the best route is not the shortest or the direct route. And in fact, if you need to make an afternoon fuel stop, stopping in a valley can give you a huge penalty because then you're departing with those extreme temperature swings. So instead, oftentimes, we're gonna take a dog leg, even if it takes us farther away from our shortest route to the destination, we'll take that dog leg out to a place where the airport that we're landing at is fairly open. And we're gonna to try to bias it towards a place that would typically have cooler temperatures. It's gonna give us a lot more advantages. On the other hand, if you're departing from a valley, an early morning departure can make a big difference because they are full of a cold air pool, which really boosts your performance. And this is especially true in places like the Colorado Rockies and the Sierra Nevada. When you get into mountain valleys that have much more moisture, keep in mind those mornings might develop a cloud layer that socks the valley in until mid-morning. So that can delay you. But in a dry valley, an early morning departure is almost always the best option. Okay, if you've used our iOS apps, you'll notice a while ago we launched a couple of test case challenges. We're gonna start hitting that full time now. So I've got a link down below. You can join these on an iOS app, so like your iPhone or your iPad, and it's free for you to take. It gives you a way to see whether you've actually retained some of the information that we've talked about in this video. And we're gonna start doing this in full force for all of our courses as well. It'll give you a way to stay connected as you're going through your training. Of course, our sale is still going on through Thursday, 20% off all of our courses, both on the website, boldmethod.com, 
and on your iOS device. And then finally, our next video is going to talk about thunderstorms, specifically air mass thunderstorms that pop up throughout the day. We're gonna focus on what drives them, what can inhibit them or blow a forecast, and tools that you can use when you're planning a flight to kind of minimize their impact. But before we get into that, if there is something that you're using right now as you're planning a flight to help you identify routes or the impact of thunderstorms, let me know in the comments down below or send us an email to questions at boldmethod.com.